I was saying that, uh, oh, I, I was reminded of my own hair up here when I used to have it. Uh, David, David, you had my hair. Where was David at? He's here somewhere. You had my hair. That looked like my hair from a picture I saw today on Facebook back in the 70s. But let me begin by just uh, letting you know about this fact. I think it'll really help you. Uh, in, in case you don't know, there's four phases of life. Four phases of life. Phase number one, you believe in Santa Claus. Then phase two, you don't believe in Santa Claus. Phase three, you are Santa Claus. <laughs> and phase four, you look like Santa Claus. <laughs> Just trying to be helpful here. Tonight, I want to share with you three ideas, three things that you want to try? Okay, just keep moving. There's three things that every one of us has to deal with in our life. And, and there's three decisions that we make in these three areas that really impact us probably every single day. Are we all right? Okay, that's good. I don't know if we'll make all that much difference, but I, I'm a little more comfortable with it. <laughs> yeah, I can move my hands now. That's right. Will we choose fear? Who will be our friends? And will we decide to forgive? And those are the three areas I especially feel in my heart to share with you about tonight. Kind of practical stuff. Who will we forgive? Who's going to be our closest friends? And will we choose fear over faith? I like to, frankly, talk about fear. When I'm full of a room, uh, when I'm in a in a room full of people that believe and that are uh, that are full of faith, now that may sound may, may sound kind of odd that you want to talk about fear in front of people that have faith. But what we realize is this: that fear and faith are a lot alike. They both believe that what you cannot see will come to pass, and that's why fear likes to jump in and take the place of faith in our lives. And we really have a very distinct choice between living a faith-filled life or a fear-filled life. You see, I like to say it this way. Fear and worry are like interest paid in advance on something you're not going to own. How many of you would pay interest on a car you know you'd never drive? Would you pay interest in advance on a house you know you'd never move into? Of course you wouldn't. But isn't that the way that fear tries to steal and rob from us? It tries to act like that, like interest paid in advance on something you're never going to own. There's a great evangelist named Billy Sunday. He said this. He said, fear knocked at my door. Faith answered. And there was no one there. I want to let you know tonight this good word, that faith, I'm rather, that fear is a poor chisel to carve out your tomorrows. And tonight, if you're viewing your future from a position of fear, here's the good news. What you fear is not correct. What you are afraid of is not accurate. It's distorted. It's out of line. I promise you this. It's not right. You know, the Swedish, the Swedish have an old saying that I think is so true. It says this, worry gives a small thing a big shadow. Isn't it true? Worry gives a small thing a big shadow. And haven't you noticed that when we begin to worry, it never stays small? If we allow it to come into our lives, we allow it to take root in our lives, fear, it doesn't stay that size. It wants to grow and grow and create this huge shadow that over-dominates our whole life, wants to influence every area of our life. The Bible says that we should cast down, have nothing to do with, 
vain imaginations, those things that proclaim themselves as higher than God. That's what fear tries to do. And that's why as soon as you get it, you should cast it down. Get rid of it. Don't give it a chance to take root and grow. Worry gives a small thing a big shadow. I was uh, leaving my office at the end of a day. This was several years ago, many years ago, actually. Uh, And I began to walk out of my office building. And as I did, I noticed that I had a bump on my knee. And I, 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 I noticed that this bump was so big that it actually made my pants stick out right there. And I looked at my bump, and I, this thought came to me. You didn't bump your knee on anything. And I gave place to that thought. And I began to replay my whole day, convincing myself I'd not bump my knee on anything. You know what? You should never build a case against yourself. Don't put water in your own boat. The storm will put enough in on its own. And I began to convince myself, replay my day that I'd not bump my knee on anything. And guess what happened? A second thought came to me. You've had bumps before. This feels different. This doesn't feel like a bump. It feels like a lump. Now, I knew I didn't bump my knee on anything. I was persuaded of it. I've had bumps before. This feels different. And within five minutes of thinking like this, as I was driving home, I began to picture myself playing golf with only one leg. You see, through fear and worry, I'd allowed, I'd gone from a bump to a lump to a stump. In five minutes. <laughs> and I don't know if you do this or not. I did this. I went, time out, John. You're so stupid. <laughs> I thank you that by Jesus' stripes, I was healed. Believers can lay their hands on the sick and that they recover. And I put my hand on my knee and I prayed a prayer. And of course, by the time I got home, that bump was completely gone. But I'd allowed, right, a small thing to become a big shadow. Cast down those vain imaginations. You see, worry is this. It's the misuse of God's creative imagination that he's given to every one of us. It's the misuse. I mean, think about how amazingly creative we are. You don't think you're creative? Look at yourself. Listen to yourself when you're full of fear. We're so creative. It's the misuse of it. And then when we do that, we wonder, why don't we get any ideas? Why don't we get any insight? Why don't we get any kind of revelation? Because we're misusing it over here in the area of fear and worry. You see, I believe that when fear comes, we should actually expect the opposite. Faith to rise up inside of us. You know, really, in many ways, the Bible was written to teach us to expect the opposite of what we see in the natural. Fear comes, let's faith come. Lack tries to come into your life, believe for God to provide for you. Sickness tries to come into you, believe the opposite for God to heal you and raise you up and strengthen you. Expect the opposite. That's what the Bible says in 2 Timothy 1, 7. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, right? But the opposite, it says he's given us power, love, and a sound mind. He's not given you a spirit of fear. The word worry itself, it comes from an Anglo-Saxon word that simply means to choke or to strangle. And it's no doubt that it paralyzes us. You know, overanalysis leads to paralysis. That's why you got to give it to God you got to cast it down. The Bible says that we should do this in 1 Peter. Cast all our cares upon God because he cares so much for us. How many of you like to fish? I like to fish. I love that word, cast. It's like throw it out there. Get rid of it. Don't just hand it off where you can get it right back. No, 
Casting all your cares, all of them. Don't keep any of them. Give them all to God because he cares so much for you and I. William Ward said this. He said, worry is faith in the negative. It's trust of the unpleasant. It's assurance of disaster and belief in defeat. He said, worry is a magnet that attracts negative conditions, but faith is a much more powerful force that creates positive circumstances. Worry is wasting today's time to clutter up tomorrow's opportunities with yesterday's troubles. Isn't that well said? You see, don't ever give anything the benefit of the doubt. Doubt has no benefit. You see, here's the fact. Fear wants you to run from something that isn't after you. And many people spend their whole lives running from things, afraid of things, unsure of things, full of fear about things that aren't even after them at all. That wants you to run from things that aren't after you. You see, there's really only two choices, really. Fear or faith. Fear or faith. We could be like this little boy named Billy. The pastor asked little Billy, If he said his prayers every night. Yes, sir, the boy replied. And the pastor continued and said, Do you always say them in the morning, too? No, sir, said Billy. I'm not scared in the daytime. (laughs) You see, we have a choice between fear and faith and how we respond to things that come our way. But if you can't help worrying, remember that worrying can't help you either. And a friend of mine once said this. He said, don't tell me that, don't tell me that worry doesn't do any good. I know better. The things that I worry about don't happen. And psychologists tell us that nearly 99% of the things that you and I worry about never happen. You see, there's things we lost sleep over a year ago. We can't even remember tonight. Don't be running from things that aren't after you. The Bible says in Psalms 27, it says that the Lord is the strength of our life. Of whom then shall we be afraid? The Lord is the strength of our lives. Of whom then shall we be afraid? You know, many of our fears can be traced back to a fear of man. To a fear of man. But the Bible says, in God I will trust. I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to us? Really, what can mortal man do to us? You see, people would worry less about what others think of them if they only realized how seldom they do. I better say that one again. People would worry less about what others think of them If they only realize how seldom they do. They're not thinking about you. They're wondering what you're thinking about them. You see, most people believe their doubts and doubt their beliefs. But we should do like the old saying and feed our faith and then watch our doubts starve to death. You see, it only seems as if you're doing something when you're worrying about things. It's like a rocking chair. It kind of keeps you going, but you don't really get anywhere. And fear of the future is also waste of the present. And know this, don't fear the future. You know why? God is already there. He's already there, and he's working on your behalf, and he's for you, not against you. He's lining up things. He's setting people in place. Things are already happening. He's working on your future today, right now. Corey Ten Boom said, uh, she said, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Isn't that Isn't that good? So here's the way to attack it. Faith plus action conquers fear. Faith with action will conquer fear. 
And that's why my charge to all of us, myself included, is to do something on Monday. There is something probably that every single one of us have fears about. Maybe that's plagued us. There may be some of you that have, it's an enduring kind of a regular thing. Every time you step out and in a certain direction with God, this fear comes up. But let me tell you what the most powerful thing is on Monday. I pray that God gives you action to take right at that fear. Action attacks fear. You know, faith without works is dead. I got an I got a invite years ago at a Bible school in Tulsa, and they asked me to teach on faith. Now, if you know anything about Tulsa, some of that city is known for faith. You know, it's kind of a faith place. And I thought the guy was kidding me when he asked me to come preach on, or not, not preach, but actually teach on faith. And I said, I'd only do it under two conditions. Can I also talk about works? And can I also talk about love? Because faith works by love. Faith without works is dead, and you got to have it all. So think about it. A good prayer this weekend, if I could. Lord, what action do you want me to take against that thing, that fear that troubles me, that always pops up, that's coming against our family, that's raising its ugly head? What step of faith towards that do you want me to take? You know that everything that you want and everything that God wants, wants for you. You know where it is? It's right on the other side of your fear. Think about it. Everything you want, everything that God wants for you is right on the other side, right on the other side of your fear. The Bible says so many good things about fear and worry. It talks about, again, how he didn't give us that fear, right? But the opposite power, love, and a sound mind. I want to close this thought on fear with a famous poem. It goes like this. Said the sparrow to the robin, I'd really like to know why, this, why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, well, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. You see, worry is a route that leads from somewhere to nowhere. Never let it direct your life. You ought to come out of this weekend so full of faith, so intent to do what God wants you to do, knowing that he's, on, he's, on, he's, he's in your future, he's working on your behalf, he's lining things up. And don't let Monday go. Seriously, without taking some kind of action towards a fear. I'm going to do something, even preparing for this. I know there's an action I need to take of something that's been kind of, I've been fearful about. And I'm going to do it, and I'm not going to wait till Tuesday. And I'm traveling most of the day on Monday, actually. But I'm going to do that, and I encourage you to do the same. The second idea is who are your friends. Now, sometimes people say, what do you mean? Well, let me give you a definition of a best friend. A best friend is somebody who brings out the best in you. A best friend brings out the best in you. A best friend is not somebody that maybe you've known since kindergarten, but every time you're around them, you get more full of fear. You get more full of doubt. You get more angry. You're even meaner to your wife after you've been around this person. That's not your best friend. Because best friends bring out the best in you. And I want to let you know that God cares greatly about who you associate with. Who you open up your life to. Who you let talk and share uh, their, their dreams with you. And who you open up to and open up your life to. God cares about who we connect to. And I believe, without any doubt whatsoever, that there's going to be people who will go to hell because of who they associated with here on earth. And there will be people who will be in heaven for all eternity because they made good choices about who they associated with. 
The Bible says this in Proverbs 27. A mirror reflects a man's face, but what he's really like is shown by the kind of friends he chooses. Now, I want to give context to what I'm about to share with you on friends. I am not saying to not reach out and help those that are having a difficult time. I'm not saying that at all. Yes, we must do that. We must help those that are struggling, have made bad mistakes, that need our genuine help, that need that word of encouragement that we heard earlier, Gary, encouraging us to do, right? We still want to do that. What I am talking about is who you hang out with, who you spend time with, who you open up your life to. I'm going to share a story that changed my life. This is absolutely true, what I'm about to share with you. You see, about 30 years ago, I was a very unsuccessful person. I just really was not in a good, in a good place at all. And I had, uh, I had decided to go to a luncheon that was sponsored by my church. It was a men's luncheon, actually. And they would have this once a month. And we would go to this particular restaurant, and uh, a speaker would share. We'd eat some food. It would go from 12 to 1, and then we'd all go back to work, right? And I went to this luncheon, and the speaker shared, and I ate my lunch, and people began to leave, and I'm still at this restaurant, and I'm hanging out with four or five other Christian men. Um, I'm trying to describe them. Can I say this? They were a bunch of Christian losers. Is that candid enough? I'm saying that in, so I can give you a picture. They were just unproductive people. They were just, I was hanging out with them. I'm sitting at a table with them. And guess what time it is? It's 1.45 in the afternoon. The thing ended at 1. I'm hanging out with all these unproductive people. It's 1.45. That ought to tell you how diligent I was, how hardworking I was, how full of passion for God I was, and how I was pursuing my dream. I'm hanging out with these guys. And guess what we're talking about? I mean, if you really listen to our words, we were all talking about why we're not successful. That's, I mean, really, that's what we're all talking about. I mean, a lot of these guys had had four or five jobs the last year. They, they said, God told me to do this this week, and God told me to do something the next week, and God told me to do something this month and next month, and this was the people I'm hanging out with. It's 1.45 in the afternoon. And right in the middle of those conversations, the Lord spoke to my heart. And he said this. He said, John, you're becoming exactly like these guys. He continued, he said, there's some people I don't want you to be around anymore. And he gave me their names. Began to give me names. He continued, he said, there's some people that you can be around for a limited time in certain circumstances. And again, he gave me their names. Now, here's the beautiful thing about God. When he calls you out of darkness, he doesn't leave you in the dusk. He takes you into the light, right? He continued and he said, there are some people I want you to be around. And he gave me three names. Well, I got up from the table immediately. I walked to the southwest corner of that parking lot. I pointed my finger towards heaven and I said, God, I'll do it. I went straight home because you had to go home to make a phone call back then. <laughs> I went straight home. I got on the phone. I can picture it right now as I'm telling you this. I got on the phone. I dialed the number of those three guys and I said, I hope you don't mind, but I need to get together with you on a regular basis. These were men. That when I was around them, I was better. I wasn't worse. When I was around them, my faith was stronger. And I was encouraged. These were men that saw the gift and call in my life. And they were for me. And even I was even nicer to my wife when I hung around these guys. 
I called all three of those guys. They all said yes. And I want to let you know, my life changed. I noticed a change that day, that very day, when I began to choose to associate with the right people. You see, a day away from the wrong associations, it's like a day in the country. And I have found, listen, I found it's better to be alone than in the wrong company. And the less you associate with some people, the more your life will improve. And have you noticed that a lot of people are like clouds? And how much brighter your day gets when they go away. (laughs) The Bible says that bad company corrupts good character. And think about it. Don't almost all of your sorrows, all of your difficulties, all of your troubles, don't they spring out of wrong relationships so many times? I'm talking about something important here. Who you associate with. Who you open up to. Charlie Tremendous Jones. I don't know if you know or heard of Charlie. I had the honor of kind of getting to know Charlie. He's a great man. He's with the Lord now. But he said this. He said, you're the same today that you're going to be five years from now. Except for two things. The books you read and the people with whom you associate. I found that a single conversation with the right person when God brings them into your life can be more valuable than many years of study. I can think over my life when men have come into my life and they've said things to me and it changed the course of my life. The Bible says that he that walks with wise men will be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. You become like you, you become like those that you closely associate with. So choose your associations carefully. The old saying is true. He that lies down with dogs shall rise up with fleas. <laughs> and if you run with wolves, you'll learn how to howl. But if you associate with eagles, you'll learn to soar to great heights. Good friends, multiply your joy and divide your grief. Good friends... Never get in your way unless you're on your way down. A good friend walks in when everybody else is walking out. The right kind of friends are those that you can dare to be yourself in front of, dare to dream out loud in front of. And for me, my best friends are those who understand my past. They believe in my future and they accept me today just the way I am. The book of Proverbs says this, that in 25, Proverbs 25 says, putting confidence in an unreliable man is like chewing with a sore tooth or trying to run with a broken foot. You see, there's always going to be people who will try to come into your life and try to give you reasons why you can't do what you know God wants you to do. You know what you should do? Ignore them. I give you permission tonight to ignore some people, to ignore them. You see, when God gets ready to bless your life, you know what he does? He sends a person into your life. God blesses people through people. And he didn't write solo parts for any of us. The, the, the most uh, ridiculous statement ever is a self-made man. It doesn't happen. But ne- let me tell you this. As you grow in God, as things begin to increase and God begins to move in your life and you begin to get closer to him and he begins to use you, guess what's going to happen? Some of your associations are going to change. Some of your friends are not going to want you to go on. And many of the reasons why people don't continue with God, they get started with God, but they don't continue is because there's a few friends that don't want them to go on. They want them to stay where they are and you're going to have some choices to make. Remember those three guys? God sent them into my life without a doubt. They're still my friends today, but none of them speak into my life like they did back then. You see, I have new associations, new people 
that I'm interacting with and opening up to. You see, friends will either stretch your vision or they'll choke your dream. And know this, that not everybody has a right to speak into your life. So stop letting them. Don't let just anybody speak into your life. Once upon a time, a beautiful, independent, self-assured princess happened upon a frog in a pond. The frog said to the princess, I was once a handsome prince until an evil witch put a spell on me. But one kiss from you and I'll turn back into a prince. Then we can marry. We can get married. We can move into the castle with my mom. You can prepare my meals, clean my clothes, bear my children, and forever feel happy doing so. Later that night, while the princess ate frog legs, she kept laughing and saying, I don't think so. You see, not everybody has a right to speak into your life. So stop letting them. If you're a member and you're a committed person in your church, your pastor has a right to speak into your life. My wife has a right to speak into my life. She can ask me anything, anytime, any place, anywhere. And she frequently does. <laughs> she has a right to speak into my life. But my noisy negative neighbor, my noisy coworker, the negative person that's always trying to pull everybody down, they don't have a right to speak into my life and they don't have a right to speak into yours. You know, if you don't remember anything else of any other nuggets I share, I hope you remember that not everybody has a right to speak into your life. Let the word of God speak into your life. Let those that God sent to you, that's connected with you, let them speak into your life, not just anybody. You see, you're certain, you're certain to get the worst end of the bargain when you exchange ideas with the wrong person. A couple other tips. Never receive counsel from unproductive people. <laughs> Have you ever noticed they always want to tell you how to do things, but they don't know how to do anything themselves? And never discuss your problems with somebody who's incapable of contributing to the solution. And have you ever noticed that those that don't succeed, they're always the first to tell you how, how not to do it. I like to put it this way. Don't follow anybody who's not going anywhere. And you and I are never to follow anybody further than he or she follows Jesus Christ. You see, with some people you spend an evening, and with others you invest it. Wise is the man or woman who fortifies their life with right associations. Know this, God has right friends for you. And today, as I was speaking, I'm sure that names came to some of you. Maybe names that you need to say, not so much time with. Not, all the, not in these circumstances. Or maybe it's, I need to disconnect. I need to not be around this person. And maybe there's some folks, even in this room, between you and that other person that God has truly sent into your life, that is an iron sharpening iron person, that does bring out the best in you, and you need to invest more time in that relationship with that person. And I encourage you, in fact, I exhort you, that that is the Holy Spirit talking to you in the same way that he talked to me about who you should associate with and say no to. You know, no, no. The word no is an anointed word. It's powerful. It's an anointed word. And the word yes and the word no control your entire destiny. So don't be afraid to do the right thing when the Holy Spirit leads you that way. God cares for you in relation to who you associate with. Finally, the last one is I want to talk about forgiveness. The simple question is, who do you need to forgive? 
wow, this place, this weekend, being around these people, this music, and, and the teaching that you're getting is a perfect environment to get rid of unforgiveness. It's, it's the perfect place. You could come back being a person full of forgiveness. I like to say if you want to travel far, travel light. How many of you want to travel far? The way to do it is to travel light. Unpack your envies. Unpack this week in your jealousies. Unpack your thoughts of unforgiveness and ridiculous ideas of revenge. Who do you want to, who do you need rather, to forgive? Joe was in trouble. You see, Joe had forgot his wedding anniversary. And, <laughs> and his wife was really mad. In fact, she said to Joe, tomorrow morning, I expect to find a gift in the driveway that goes from zero to 200 in six seconds. And it better be there. You hear me? Zero to 200 in six seconds. Well, the next morning, Joe got up early and left for work. When his wife woke up, she looked out the window, and sure enough, there was a box gift-wrapped sitting in the middle of the driveway. Well, she was kind of confused, and she put on a robe and went outside and got to the driveway, picked up the box and brought it back into the house, and she opened it up, and inside the box was a brand-new bathroom scale. (laughs) And Joe's been missing since last Friday. (laughs) You see, (laughs) unforgiveness. I couldn't resist, Gus. That doesn't go over quite so well if there's ladies in the room. Unforgiveness always does a great deal more damage in the vessel in the vessel in which it's stored than the object on which it's poured. And think about it, guys. Is there anything more pathetic and sad? Is there anything more pathetic and sad than somebody who's harbored a grudge for many years? You know those people. You haven't seen them for 10 years, and they're still stuck in that same place. They bring it up. They tell the story. They're full of... Uh, unforgiveness. It's just pathetic. And without forgiveness, life ends up just being an endless sile of resentment and retaliation, and what a waste that is. But Jesus said this. He said something pretty serious. He said, for if you forgive men, he said this in Matthew, if you forgive men when they sin against you, guess what? Your heavenly Father your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not, listen, if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's why this weekend, in this men's group, men's conference, men's camp, men's retreat, a retreat to advance, right? It's a perfect place to forgive. There may be people that are even in this room that you need to forgive. You may need to forgive yourself. You may need to forgive your spouse, your, your children. There's probably names coming to you. You know, when I was working on this, it just a, not earlier today, just going over it, there was a situation that, that the Lord convicted me on that I need to, I need to forgive. You see, what really matters What really matters is what happens in us, not to us. And don't say, you don't know, John, what that person did to me. Just instead know what unforgiveness will do to you. And one of the most lasting pleasures you can experience, I'm telling you tonight, one of the greatest pleasures you can experience is the feeling that comes over you when you genuinely forgive somebody, whether they ever know it or not. 
Don't carry, don't carry a grudge. Don't carry a grudge any longer. Because while you're carrying the grudge, the guy that you're mad at is out producing. He's, out, he's going on with his life, and your grudge isn't hurting him at all. You see, we're called as Christians to build bridges and not to burn them. And don't ever underestimate the power of forgiveness to loose you, to free you, to accomplish your goals. You know what? You may have been praying for breakthrough in your life, in your business, in your profession. You may have been praying for direction. You may have been praying for favor. And God may be saying, the answer is, forgive that guy over there. Forgive this person over there. Forgive your spouse. That may be God's answer right there. Just simply being a person of forgiveness. If you're in ministry in any way, shape, or form in the church, here's something you need to think about. If you want to be a shepherd, you have to be able to stand the smell of sheep. Because it's challenging. You're going to be disappointed. People are going to say things. People are going to do things. And I believe of all people, they have more opportunity to be offended and to be able to walk in forgiveness at the same time. And the cool thing about forgiveness is the further you walk in it, the greater distance you put from that situation in you. You know how if you're full of unforgiveness, I mean, it's right there. It doesn't take anything to stir it up. It's right there. You can bite into an apple and think about Bill and what he did to you, and you're just eating an apple. But when you forgive somebody, you put distance between that situation and yourself. You see, I think the only people, the only people you ought to try to get even with are those who have helped you. And here's what I've found. Here's what successful people do. They have an ability to not they have an ability to not let things stick to them. Some things need to be unstuck from you through the power of forgiveness. One Sunday morning, before the service began, the people were sitting in their pews and you know they were talking about the week and what had happened during the week and their kids and all the things that are going on. And suddenly, right then, the devil appeared in the middle of this church service. Right in the front of the church. People began to scream. They began to shout. They began to run out of the church as fast as they could. They wanted to get away from him. Soon, everybody had run out of the church. Except for one elderly gentleman who sat calmly in his pew, not moving at all. He seemed to be oblivious to the fact that God's ultimate enemy was right there in front of him. Of course, this confused the devil. And he went over to the old man and he said, Don't you know who I am? The man replied, Yep, I sure do. Satan said, Aren't you afraid of me? Nope, not at all. Well, he was perturbed by that. And he said, Why aren't you afraid of me? The man calmly replied, I've been married to your sister for over 40 years. <laughs> Don't let things stick to you. You see, forgiveness, forgiveness is, this is what Christianity is all about. There's two marks of a Christian. Some of you know Jack Hayford, right? Good man. I had the privilege of helping Jack with a book a number of years ago. It was a book called The Key to Everything. What a title. He said this. There's two marks of a Christian. Two. Giving and forgiving. Giving and forgiving. You see, guys, tonight, if you really want to be miserable, if you genuinely want to be totally miserable, then hate somebody. You see, when you've been wronged, a poor memory is the best response. So forgive your enemies. It's the one power you have over that person. And forgive your enemies. Because you know why? Nothing will annoy them more. 
You see, I believe it's obvious that God is operating strong in your life when you forego revenge and dare to forgive somebody else. You can't get ahead while you're trying to get even. And being offended is the bait of Satan to get you out of the will of God. Being offended, being unforgiving, is the lure of the devil to get you out and off the path that God wants you to be on. You see, to forgive is to set the prisoner free and discover the prisoner was you. So who do we need to forgive tonight? Who do we need to forgive before we go home? I pray that God will show you, because all of us deal with it. Every person here, I know, we all have opportunities to be offended. But we, get, we have equal and greater opportunities, I believe, to walk in forgiveness. So God didn't give you a spirit of fear, right? The opposite, power, love, and a sound mind. And God has right associations for you. He blesses people through people, and he sends people into our lives. But we need to be careful who we open up our lives to and who we let speak into our lives. And we need to be the most forgiving people on the face of the earth because we know what it's like to be forgiven ourselves. We know what it's like to have a Savior come and offer that to us when we deserve death and damnation of all people. I mean, he, the perfect God, creator of the universe, huh, he did that for us. We should be as much forgiving to others because we love him so much, right? So, Father, I thank you tonight. I thank you, God, that you care about every single area of our lives. Father, I thank you again, Lord, that you have taken fear, Father, from us. You didn't even give it to us, but you give us something to do about it. We can give it to you, God. We can cast our cares upon you because you care so much for every single person here. Father, I thank you for that in the lives of every person. I thank you for right friends, Father, for every person here. Father, I pray if names came to them, I pray that they would take action. Father, I pray that they would say no to wrong people, even people from the opposite sex that want to come into their lives and destroy their marriage and and interfere in their lives. I come against that by the authority of Jesus' name. Wrong associations be gone from the life of every person here. And God, thank you for bringing right people into our lives. Because I know that you use people, Father, to bless others. And Father, thank you, oh Lord, for sending your son Jesus that we can receive forgiveness in our own lives. And Father, shouldn't we offer the same to others when we've been wrong? Even if it looks like that we're 100% right, We know that we're 100% wrong when we don't offer that forgiveness. We need your forgiveness, Father, so we choose to forgive others tonight. We ask this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for the privilege of sharing with you. It's an honor. It really is. Can Can I mention one thing, just one other additional thing on a side note? And, and I used to feel uncomfortable a little bit about talking about some things that I bring, but I, I know that God uses them. I mean, it's ministry. It's the same ministry. Everything that we do is all ministry. There's some of you that may have an interest in writing a book. And many of you know that I've had the great honor of helping work with Gus on his new book, which will be out very soon, hopefully, in a few months. And it's going to be a, it's a great book, and you'll want to get a couple thousand of them each. You know, give them out to everybody you know. But I want to let you know that I have a, because people, I've been the head of three publishing companies. I've written all these books. So for my whole life, people have come up to me and asked me about books. And what I did is I took everything I know about 
writing the book of your dreams and how to sell it everywhere you can, and I put it into a tool. It's a book, it's a, it's a manual, it's got DVDs and all this stuff, but it also includes a couple of personal consultations with me where we talk about your book, and I ask you questions, and I give you advice, and et cetera. So if any of you ever feel led in your heart, you know, I do have that available. We have a digital version. I brought a physical thing here, but if you have any interest in that, I didn't want to uh, leave without giving you an opportunity because it could be that God wants you to write a book, and it may be for a few hundred people, or it may be for a few hundred million people. Only God knows. And there's nobody more shocked on the face of the earth than what God can do with a book than me. I mean, honestly, I am like, <laughs> I am totally surprised. I am living evidence of exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ever hope, imagine, dream, whatever words you want to put in there, I am that guy. And I'd be honored to help you in that way. And again, thank you, Gus. Thank you, Steve. It's been a blessing to be with you. God bless you. Amen. Amen.